Yeah. Hi, Hi, Sherry. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Sure. good. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Morning. 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 Well, we're, we're waiting for Heidi to join us. There were a lot of beans trying to get on. Hmm. Morning, Joe. How are you? I'm doing good, Jeff. How are you this morning? Just fine, thank you. Aaron, while we're waiting, could you share the agenda, please? Sure. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Can you see that, Jeff? No, I see your screen. It hasn't opened yet. I'm gonna try it again. Okay. <laughs> There we go. Okay. So, uh, welcome to the first Workspace Learners Coordinators meeting. My name is Jeff Cathcart, and I am I take care of the Connecticut Pre-Apprenticeship High School Training Program. And joining me today from my end uh, is Erin Gingerella, and she is our digital content developer. Good morning, everyone. How are you? So we're going to ask uh, anyone that's not speaking to please to please mute themselves. That may help with the bandwidth. And we'd like to start this morning uh, with just a few words from the Connecticut Department of Transportation. I okay. See. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Is Deb here? Deb. Can you tell? I'm here. Oh, great. Okay. Hi, Deb. Hey, how are you? Hi. Good. Deb. Hi. Did you want to say a few words, Deb? Yeah, I can, I can just say a few things. Okay. Um, well, good morning. Um, we're really excited to have this program. 
Um, it is, uh, it's a wonderful addition and the laborers are great. That Those are the two things that I can say. And they were so responsive with regard to dealing with the pandemic and trying to come up with an alternative program to what we currently already have and developing this virtual program. So we're really excited and we hope that the schools will take advantage of this wonderful program and to provide information to their students about the different opportunities in the transportation field of construction. So thank you and good morning. And I just wanted to add, we're, we're happy to have you here this morning, um, interested in learning more about careers in the construction industry. So thank you. Jeff has an excellent program plan for us. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, and now, if if each one of the schools would, uh, each one of the uh, work-based learning co coordinators would identify themselves, and if you could just let us know what's happening at your school. Are you in person? Are you remote? Are you a combination? Are you remote for academics, but in person for shop? It would just, it would help us quite a bit so we can understand what's going on in your world. Jeff, do you want to ask them uh, by name? Sure, I'm going to go look at my screen and I'm going to start with Sandeep. Yes, hi, good morning. I'm uh, the Dean of Student at Bullet Havens. Uh, right now, we are in phase three. That means for last week and this week, our kids are all virtual because we have few COVID cases at the school. Okay, so and not much is going on with work-based learning because we have to suspend all the work-based learning and job sharing opportunities at this time. Okay, thank you. And that's Bullard Haven. Yes, okay. sir. Stacy. I, I, Stacy, I see that you're unmuted and I see that your lips are moving, but I don't hear anything. <laughs> Oh boy. Stacy, may, maybe just um, type it in the chat. Okay. They see is from high Wyndham and they are hybrid. Perfect. Okay. Uh, okay, we're remote, just switched to all virtual due to subbing issues. Okay, okay. Uh, I have Wilder Z. Hello, my name Hi. is Wilder Zandanella. Hi, I'm the Dean of Students at Prince Tech in Hartford. Okay. Uh, we are currently hybrid um, as well, at least through, I think the beginning of Oh, sorry. Um, and work-based learning is going okay. It's actually going a little bit better than I anticipated. I've signed up a few students, which is typical for Hartford. Um, so I'm so I'm pleased so far that I've gotten a few students out working. Okay. And what types of uh, what types of work are they doing? Um, I signed up specifically this year a student in manu automated manufacturing um, collision. And I cannot remember at this moment, but I have a couple of kids out as electricians, um, a couple of kids out in plumbing. Wonderful. Wonderful. Low numbers, but better than years past. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, Michael Garcia. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm getting students over at Vinyl Technical High School in Middletown. Uh, we are in a hybrid model as well. Um, we've had a, a few COVID cases, but you know we still have students coming in person uh, on a modified schedule. I have a handful of students out on work-based learning, a um, couple of electrical students, a uh, few HVAC students, um, and we're, we're pushing forward with manufacturing right now, uh, as well as carpentry. So we're, we're doing okay. Good, good, thank you. 
uh, Betsy. Betsy, we can't hear your voice. No, you are no. unmuted, but we can't hear you. Maybe type it in the chat. Can you repeat that, please? I didn't hear it. We're just asking Betsy um, to type in the chat. Because her microphone isn't responding. Great, thank you, Betsy. Goodwin, perfect, thank you very much. Moving over to Cynthia, please. Hi, I'm the Dean of Students at Wilcox High School. We're doing hybrid and um, I have about 20 something kids out right now. I have um, kids out in carpentry, electrical, machine tool, plumbing, HVAC, automotive and auto collision. So, okay. and so when you say hybrid, uh, uh, which are they in school for? Hi academics or shop or how does that work? It switches. It switches every week. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Okay. So it's, it's been working okay so far for us. Sure. Thank you. Okay. And I believe is, is it PASCO neck? P-A-S-C-O-N-E-N-E-K? Uh, yeah, hi, this is hi. Kim. Um, I am the Dean of Students at Ellis Tech. We are hybrid, so some of our kids are virtual and some are in the building. Um, I'm struggling with WBL. My numbers are usually much higher. Uh, lost some employers because we they lost the continuation of having the kids when they were um, told not to participate back in March. Uh, and I'm, I will share that I am struggling a little bit with the paperwork as far as getting signatures. It was easier when it was paper-based. Hmm. So it's, you know, trying to contact parents and students when they're not in the building and our students are, not that it's your problem, but um, they are inundated with emails and such. And it's very hard for everybody to keep up on their end, you know, so sure. trying. Um, we certainly have wonderful um, mentors and we're making connections with them. It's just a little slower than usual. Great, that's exactly the type of information that we're looking for. What that's school was that again, Jeff? I'm sorry, asking that. Mm -hmm. Ellis Tech and Danielson. Thank in you. In the northeast corner. Thanks. Nick, please. I am the Dean of Students at Caner Tech in Waterbury. And right now we are in phase three as well. So all the students are virtual. Um, I had some going out on work-based learning before we went to all virtual. Uh, we'll see, we're supposed to come back tomorrow. So we'll see if that happens or how long we're back. I'm, I'm not really sure because Waterbury's in the, the red zone right now. All right, thank you very much. Would it be Carol J, C-A-R-O-J? Hi, I'm Josette Caraballo, Dean of Students at Cheney Tech in Manchester. We had Hi. the pleasure of having you here at Genie Tech. You presented to our students. Uh, we've been doing pretty good. We have students out uh, that are doing work-based learning in HVAC, electrical, diesel, carpentry, auto, manufacturing, ISP, and welding. Nice. Um, over 20 plus students out doing work-based learning with a couple in the hopper uh, in various trades, uh, trying to get apprenticeship uh, students out and setting up their meetings. Uh, paperwork is a little more challenging, um, but we're moving forward in uh, these times and Cheney Tech is in hybrid mode. So uh, it's hybrid both in academics and trades. 
Great, great. Well, it sounds like there's good things happening at Cheney. Wonderful. Yep. Uh, Jonathan. Good morning. Um, so I'm at Grasso Tech uh, down in the southeast corner in Groton. Uh, we are in the hybrid model and uh, I'm struggling a little bit with work-based learning in a sense of there's not many employers that are interested right now with uh, the pandemic going on. And um, yeah, and, and struggle with uh, students that are actually eligible based on last year's, uh, you know, uh, grades and things like that, which is going to be closing pretty soon. With the first quarter is going to be coming up, but they're still struggling in a hybrid model. The students are, are having difficulty uh, grade wise. So eligibility is huge. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That's another good piece of information. Um, Heidi, are you still on? I don't see you. No, okay. And some things shifted around on my screen. So Cynthia, did we give you an opportunity to address the group? Yes, we'll cut. Bye. Okay, yeah, we'll cut so we're good. Yep. Everybody that's on has identified themselves and our program partners will identify themselves uh, when we get to their, to their portion. Uh, Aaron, if you could, I'd like to share my screen please. And I'll give you just a brief overview of the program. Okay, so here we go. So the Connecticut Department of Transportation and the highway construction industry came together and said, where is the next generation of work going to come from? And how do we attract the next generation to the highway construction and maintenance industry? How are we going to do this? It is an aging workforce. And so the Connecticut pre-apprenticeship and high school training program was developed. It is fully funded by the Connecticut Department of Transportation and the program partners. How often does somebody come to you and say, we're not looking for money. We have the money. We have the resources. We just wanna help you. The lead instructors are from the New England Laborers Union with additional instructors from our program partners, the carpenters, electricians, iron workers, and operating engineers union. And they truly, truly are program partners. It has been in person and we just adapted to a learning portal where portions of it can be virtual. And this may help you that are on the hybrid mode. If you're looking for, for classroom content from your students, we should be able to help with that. Uh, usually it's up to a 12 day program. We have classroom instruction. We have hands-on activities. We have field trips and we have community improvement projects. Not all of our schools are vocational schools. So we do offer OSHA 10 hour certification, flagger certification, CPR first aid certification. Each participant is given a bag with personal protective equipment, a hard hat, safety glasses, work gloves, and a safety vest. And if necessary, we provide the field trip transportation. So there's not a dime that comes out of your pocket for this program. Why vocational schools? Because we know that your students know how to measure, cut, and install, and they also know how to problem solve. Whether it's wood, pipe, wire, steel, trenching, concrete, shoring, conduit, aluminum, gravel, loam, landscape, diesel, welding, demolition, it's all the same skills. Measure, cut, install, and problem solve. And it is possible to go directly from high school to an apprenticeship program. These are three 2020 high school graduates standing with Ray Johnson from the Laborers Union who are now first year apprentices working in the road industry. So what are the careers available 
in the transportation construction industry. And we are talking about highway construction because that's who our funding source is, Connecticut Department of Transportation. So we're looking at this job site and I see operators in the crane. I know the iron workers put up the steel. I know the laborers poured the concrete. I know the carpenters built the form. And I'm sure the iron workers, I'm sorry, I'm sure that the electricians are there running conduit for the intelligent transportation system. There's our program partners, the laborers, the operators, the carpenters, the iron workers, and the electricians. And they're all here with us today. First group that we have, there's just usually more of them on the job site than anybody else, are the laborers. And here they're pouring concrete, placing concrete over the rebar put in by the iron workers, the forms put in by the carpenters. There's probably conduit underneath that put in by the electricians and it was all hoisted up to the site by the operators. This is their school in Pomfret, Connecticut. This is where apprentices and journey persons go to learn the trade. Kind of looks like a college because you know what? That's what it is. That's their college. And here we have some photos of our pre-apprentice participants at the laborers union and they're putting on their hazmat suits. That's work that laborers do. They're also used cutting torches at the laborers for the demolition portion. They do line and grade. So here's at Hartford High School, we taught them line and grade. Over at the operators and the operators are the ones that run all the big yellow equipment. We have a group here sitting on a million dollar crane. There's a million dollar piece of equipment right there. But as time goes on, things change. Operators also fly drones. A drone in a matter of minutes can do calculations that would take people hours, days, weeks, and sometimes months. And some of that equipment, some of that big yellow equipment is now run by satellites. And that's their training center down in Houston, Texas. Looks like any other college campus. Here's a job site with the carpenters on it and the crane is putting the form into place that the carpenters put together surrounding the reinforcing rod that the iron workers put in. Uh, and you can also see the handrails that the carpenters put on. So any bridge that you might drive over or on, carpenters were involved in building that. Here's one of their classrooms down in Yalesville where you would go to learn the classroom portion. And then there's the shop, big, big shop space, indoor shop space for all the hands-on lessons. And carpentry is not just about building houses. There's all the forming going on for a big bridge project. And that's their training center in Las Vegas. Iron workers, if you're afraid of heights, iron workers is not for you. And Johnny Jones, the apprenticeship director said something to one of my groups one time that just stuck in my head. He said, being an iron worker is like being at the gym for eight hours a day. You've just got to be in terrific physical condition. Iron workers also do a lot of cutting and burning. They also do welding and there's the re-rod that they put, make the cages out of. And the view as an iron worker sure beats the view from the corner office. And there's one of their training centers. Electricians, this shot is of working in a tunnel. And here's a picture from their training center and hanging up here are all the harnesses. All the harnesses want to make sure that everything is done properly. And do a little bit of hands-on when the introduction to the trade is held at their training center. And here's Paul helping a couple of our students in the summer program. We built a little wall. Each student built a little wall and they wired in a receptacle and a 
light fixture and we powered it with a 12 volt battery pack. So nobody got zapped. And there's an electrician's training center. And students in our program can earn certain certifications. This is the OSHA 10 hour certification for the construction industry. So they're covering things in this like dig safe and like trenching and shoring, things that they might not have in, a, in another OSHA 10 class. They earn flag, it can earn flagger certification. You need to be certified to direct traffic. They earn CPR first aid certification. They cover work zone safety, harness, proper use of harnesses, fire extinguisher safety. We also sometimes do improvement projects. This was at a school where the designers had put sidewalk, bushes, sidewalk, and the students were walking through the bushes to get to school. So we ripped out the bushes, brought in the gravel, placed the concrete. These are students doing this under the eye, under the uh, watchful eye of our instructors. So they, we put in the sidewalk and they now have a new sidewalk to work, walk on. And this is at another school where the front of the school had all broken blue stone and the students again with the instructors jackhammer took out the concrete and put in new concrete. And this past summer we did a project at the Hartford High School. This was a community garden that was started a couple of years ago and then kind of abandoned. And we went in and cleared and grub it and built the boxes and picnic tables and mowed it. And this group moved 30 yards of plantable soil in wheelbarrows. And that's my group here. Did a great, great job. We had our program partners involved. And here was from the flagger class and then the PPE part of the program. And that was my group out on the job site. Any questions? Any questions? From I, Go ahead. I have, um, I, is it okay for me to speak? I don't want to talk Please. over anybody. Yeah. Um, I'm really amazed at all the wonderful things that are available. Um, if we have students, so say, for instance, we have a masonry program and a lot of our masonry students already know how to do some of that stuff, but I think they might benefit from uh, like the road and other special training that you guys have. How would we get our kids uh, enrolled in that? And um, yeah, I guess. And what, what school are you from? Um, Ellis Tech, Daniel. Okay. So we're sure. near Pomfret. We're right near Pomfret. Yep. I'm sure that we can, uh, I'm sure that, that, that we can work with you to, uh, to supplement your, uh, what you're currently providing to your students. And also, do, um, is there an age limit at all on this or an age minimum? Because no, we like our ideal student is a senior that is going to work upon graduation. That's our ideal student. Thank you very much, Jeff. So, sometimes we will, we will work with juniors as well, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll contact you. Hey, Jeff, can I ask a question as well? Sure. I'm at Bullet Havens in Bridgeport, and we have a lot of department that you talked about. Uh, we have masonry, we have carpentry, we have uh, electrical department. Uh, how do we get involved in this thing? It's the same thing. You, you, that's why we're here today. You, you, we get your information, we contact you, we develop a program, and we move it forward. Thank you. Appreciate your help. Hi, it's Cindy Kistner. I did field trips up to um, Pomfret, and Pomfret. we did, have, and they did interview, come to my school and talk to the kids and interviewed kids, but they wouldn't take any kids till they graduated. So that changed now. Oh no, 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 no! You'll find that any one of these programs, any one of the, you, you have certain requirements, and the five basic requirements are: eighteen years old, high school diploma, drug free. Um, driver's license and mode of transportation. Yeah, he hired eight kids one year and four kids the next year. Uh, we did La Luna, Ralph and Norio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, 
No, that's that's. So that's this isn't really like a work-based learning thing, then, right? This is an introduction to the trades and and how uh, they can move towards an apprenticeship. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Then what school are you from? Wilcox. Okay. They gave the kids breakfast. They showed them things. It was really great. Yeah. Yeah. And and again, what we're trying to show them is. It's, it's, all we're doing is supplementing their education that they have at your school. If they know how to measure, cut, and install uh, in one, they can show how they can move into one of these directions. Yeah, I would be interested. Okay. Jeff, okay. you have a comment from Stacy Boothroyd. Oh, okay. She's interested in signing up students as well. Is this considered work-based learning? I don't know what, what they consider work-based learning. It would be a job where you got paid and you went to work. I, I don't think it would be because my kids weren't work-based learning when I did it. Hi, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Oh, Betsy Feldman from EC Goodwin. So based on what you guys are saying that they have to be a graduate and have a high school diploma, it, it, it sounds more like it would be uh, a field trip experience to see what's available to them after graduation and not what we in the technical high school district would consider to be a true work-based learning situation where instead of coming to school during their shop cycle, they go out and they earn a minimum, at least a minimum wage performing these skills that enhance what they're learning in, in school. C correct, it's, it's widening their, their knowledge base. Um, I'm, there's many, many opportunities that are available to them that they may or may not know about. And that's all that we're trying to do is to make them aware of opportunities that they may or may not know about. Uh, also give them an opportunity to um, earn new skills and certifications and credentials that would help them after they leave high school. Jeff, Jeff, I think for us, it, it would be a valuable resource maybe to share with the shop teachers so that the kids maybe can earn some certificates or something to build on their resume um, to show that they've had training in such areas, say welding or job safety on the roads or that kind of thing. So I think it's worth investigating how we can incorporate it into our students' um, education. And I think maybe uh, in the portfolio section, other deans, I know not everybody's doing portfolios, but this would really be helpful for their por portfolio building. Thank you. And any other questions or comments? I have, I have a question, work-based learning. So essentially, what's the wage that they're, they're earning? I believe I heard that it needs to be at least minimum wage. Yes, so, they, have to, yep, they have to make minimum wage. Some employers pay more, um, but it has to be at least that. And they can't work um, on like a commission basis or anything like that. They also have to be paid a payroll check, not a personal check. So deductions are taken out. Okay. Sherry, the, the way that I, my normal term is co-op. Mm -hmm. with the student that's the way that I could co-op yeah. and and that is something that we are discussing and typically uh, we have co-ops at departments of public works where a student would work for a municipal department of public works they would be uh, they would do whatever it is that they wanted them to do and a lot of my experience comes from our program in Massachusetts so it's very, very common for us to have co-op students at departments of public works uh, where they may be in the automotive shop, in the diesel shop, they may do welding, uh, they may be out on the road, patching the roads or cutting up trees, doing many, many, many different things. And it, it shows them other opportunities that are available to them. Mm -hmm. And I had a, I had a, uh, an employment opportunity recently, full-time employment opportunity that was in Cheshire, mm -hmm. maintainer one for the highway department, maintainer one is paying almost $30 an hour. Mm -hmm. And the only requirements they have 
or a high school diploma. They do ask for a CDL uh, and a couple of years experience. But I would nice. see that anyone that has gone through a vocational school program could easily move in that direction. And we do have tremendous support from the municipal departments of public works. So Shari, maybe that is something that we can talk about, how mm -hmm. we can incorporate co-ops into this or, or work-based learning into this program. Gotcha. So another question then is once they do the co-op, are they hired? They are at not the, necessarily at... hired unless, okay. there's an, unless there's an opening. Mm -hmm. But we have had students that go directly from their co-op to graduation and then are hired. Yeah. I have two of them right now that are at the uh, Springfield Department of Public Works in Massachusetts. Both of these people earned their CDL while they were still in high school. I have one, another one that's in the uh, Berlin Department of Public Works in Mass Berlin, Massachusetts. Jeff, I'm sorry if you've already addressed this. I may have missed it. For the students that are doing uh, work with the Public Works Department, are they paid in the summertime while they're working alongside with the... Oh, they're always paid. Okay, so we could still consider that a WBL. For instance, if I had a diesel student yeah. in auto yeah. that was interested in you know, working for the DOT right. and had a summer placement, I'm just giving you a hypothetical, he could work during the summers helping out and perhaps during school vacations Maybe. Well, couldn't they also work during their shop week? Yes. Well, then, th then that would be WBL. But even if they were just summers, we could still do WBL. Do sure. you know what I'm mean? saying? So. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's very common. Yeah. Anything else before I move on to the website? Move on to the website. Okay. All right. Let's see how I do this now. I end show, I go over here. All right, that was seamless. Look at that, boy, I'm learning. So here we go. And this is the learning portal that Aaron developed, Aaron put together uh, so that we can take what we would typically do in person and- Hang on, Jeff. Okay. I'm still seeing your, um, I'm not seeing the website. So stop screen share. Okay. And Screen share again. Yep. Go back to your screen and to the website. How's that? Yep. You got it. I don't know what I'd do without you. <laughs> so, so here we have the website, uh, the learning portal, where we took what we had developed for in-person and moved it over uh, to, to distance learning. And I'm hearing that most of you have some type of virtual learning, and this is where it may work in well. Uh, we also developed this printable poster for your school that talks about the program and we'd be more than happy to customize anything so you could put your information right in here and use this to attract uh, students for your for the program it's a little bit about us and here we start, the most important, there was no cost to your school, no cost to your school, and some of the other items that are available to them. Here are the field trips to our program partners from past groups. We're at the operators, we're at the carpenters, we're at the iron workers, we're at the laborers, and we're at the electrician. This is what we're calling the classroom. And these are some of the lessons that are available through us. Uh, one of the things that we do that we do talk to them about is the come on, all the apprentices that are available through the construction building trades program. And we talk about the prevailing wages. And these are the monies that they can earn. And uh, let's see if I go over here to this Bethel Carpenters. I add 34 and 25. I'm up over $50 an hour uh, between my what's in my pocket and what's in my benefit package. 
uh, and many, many other items here. You can look at that at whenever you would like. And then we go to the links portion. And if you choose any one of these, it will take you to information about those trades. There's also a big push for women in construction. Nice videos here and a program for those that enter the armed forces called Helmets to Hard Hat. If you're interested in requesting a program, there you go. Those of you that said you'd be interested in talking to us about establishing something at your school, there's the request form. That'll go right to us. And here's just a few shots of our summer program. We took this and turned it into a community garden. We had a 40 foot job trailer on site. We had uh, Porta Johns. It was a real live construction zone. We had our program partners come out and work with us. And when all was said and done, Hartford High School has a beautiful community garden and it truly is a community garden. Uh, before we were done, the community had moved in and was planting things. So it's a win-win and Branford High School has already asked us to help them with one come springtime. Any questions on the on the learning portal? Great, then I am going to stop share. I'm going to give it back to Aaron. And the first program partner we're going to hear from is from the Carpenters Union. And Angelo, if you want to unmute, and I will put up your flyer. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. All right, our program is a four-year program. Uh, first of all, my name is Angelo DiFilippo. I'm with the Car North Atlantic States Carpenters Training Fund. Uh, I'm located in Yalesville, Connecticut, which is part of Wallingford. And our apprenticeship program uh, in conjunction with our local 326 Carpenters Union, um, our business agents, as uh, we train as they require workforce. So every first Monday of each month, there's an info session. If you see this pamphlet that uh, Aaron posted, uh, prior two weeks prior, the first Monday of the month is, is registration. It used to be um, in person, but now with the COVID, it's all online. So, and they sign up about, uh, I believe 42 students. So you got to register early to get on. So once you get register and you watch the info session, it tells you about the union and our program. They uh, don't call you, you need a GED or high school diploma. You will have an interview. You need to pass a drug test. And if uh, you get put to work, you start as, as a uh, 45%, which is 15.54 an hour plus benefits. So, and you you get a raise every thousand hours. So our, our program is a four year program. Um, we need a thousand hours a year and they rotate every four times a year. They attend school for a week. Uh, it's four 10 hour days and Monday to through Thursday, unless there's a uh, holiday on Monday, which Friday is a makeup. And um, really all hands-on, 90% is hands-on, 10% in the classroom. So we offer concrete forms, metal stud framing, drywall installation, uh, welding and cutting for pile driving. Um, for anybody who knows what pile driving, they put uh, down in the sub-basin grot and there's a big job there. 
has a high demand for pile drivers, which are carpenters and, you know, they weld caissons and sheet goods, uh, sheathing. You ever hear those things pounding stuff in the ground near the water? They add a piece and weld it on. Um, and so for graduation, after four years, there's five certification classes needed for graduation. One is drywall productivity, uh, first aid CPR, scaffold erecting, OSHA 30, and aerial lift and moops, which is mobile elevated work platform. So we train you at no cost, uh, free education, free training while you're working. Um, and we have a short video in our Millberry Training Center. If, uh, Aaron, if you would mind showing us a quick uh, video, please. Absolutely. Thank you. A career in carpentry is for anybody. You just gotta want it. You gotta have a positive attitude and good work ethic. And we'll provide you with the tools to be successful. We'll train you. You just need to show up and have those two qualities. You are not in our organization as an individual alone. You are part of a united brotherhood of carpenters. If you're thinking about joining the union, if you're thinking about building a career as a carpenter, if you have an interest in creating things, if you have an interest in not sitting at a desk all day, this might be the career for you. I'm a person that loves to learn, so being able to get out there and learn different things every single day is like amazing to me. Serving in the Marine Corps, that got me used to up early in the morning, PT every day, hard work, long hours, getting dirty. The camaraderie that I have with my fellow union members is very similar to the same bond that I had with uh, my fellow Marines in my platoon and my company. And you don't have to know anything, they teach you everything you need to know. And uh, over the past four years, uh, I actually have learned a lot and uh, ready to journey out. Any apprentice that goes through our program can be assured that the knowledge that they're gaining in any of our facilities will relate directly to what they're gonna need on the job to be a great carpenter, a great foreman, a great job super. We're gonna give them everything they need to grow their career within our organization. To be an excellent carpenter, it's essential to be able to be a team player and work well with others. It's a very physical job, so you have to be prepared to work hard and to be productive. Right now, we're probably about 90% time spent in the shop and 10% time spent in the classroom. For our career as carpenters, we spend our lives on our feet with tools in our hands, so I think our training reflects that well. We cover all of New England and all of New York State. And we have to make sure that our facilities are located so that apprentices and journey level carpenters have access to the same state-of-the-art training no matter where they live. And we do it for free, so that when we bring in the best and the brightest, they don't have to worry about paying tuition. We take care of that for them. All they need to do is bring the passion, the vision, the goal of lifelong learning, then you have all the tools that you'll need to succeed in our organization as an apprentice and then ultimately as a highly skilled union carpenter. I would describe the instructors as very attentive, very friendly, open, and helpful. I feel like I, I gained like a whole bunch of uncles and aunts that want to help me, want to see me prosper. It's interesting to be in this position as an instructor because I see first year apprentices come in and they're very eager, but they maybe aren't so sure of themselves. And then by the time they're a fourth year, they adapt, they're able to take the same skills that they've learned throughout the program and without any struggle, they're able to transfer it over to do anything. That is why I took this job as an instructor, to pass on what others have taught me so I can pass it on to the apprentices that are behind me. And one day they'll pass it on to keep this brother and sisterhood going. We definitely, you know, 
put our hearts on the line out here. What we do matters. You know, we're empowering the middle class and, and we care about the people that come through here. It's not just about work. It's really about the love for the trade. Very nice, Angelo. I finally got to go to Millbury. I've heard a lot about it, but I never got to go there. <laughs> uh, I am a 37, 38 year member here. I started when I was 18 years old and I retired 2017 and I was a part-time instructor and now I'm back full-time. So I got a lot to offer uh, apprentices and so, that's why I'm here. But, um, Thank a great program here. I mean, if you want to learn and with your hands, that's what we do, hands on. Can I ask Thank a question, Jeff? Question. Go ahead. Um, so, I, Ellis Tech Danielson, my name's Kim. We are actually closer to Millbury than we are to Wallingford, believe it or not. Um, so, if I have a student that's a Connecticut resident but wants to go to Mass for the training. Is that okay? That's fine. It's, yeah. You can go to once you once you belong to uh, you join a local union in in your jurisdiction, whatever training center is closest. And if they do want to go from Connecticut to Millbury, they'll put you up in. Uh, they have dorms there, but now I think they put you in a hotel up for the week, oh, so you don't have to travel back and forth. That was then my next question to a lot of our students. I know I speak for Ellis, but it's probably statewide. Really struggle with the funds to be able to um, drive, you know, between having a car and paying insurance and that kind of thing. And we don't have public transportation here. So it sounds like you are providing uh, housing for them while they work or? We don't provide transportation. We'll, uh, they have to uh, provide their own transportation to job sites and training. Okay. That's the question. And, and in many in many cases, and we talk to the students about this all the time, you have to have a driver's license just to apply. Okay, that's good information to know. Thank. Are there any um, assist, any funds to help them get their license? Jerry. Any well, when the student I, is uh, is hold on, Angelo, is, uh, Carrie. I think that's something we're looking at, right, Deb? Oh, she may not be here, but if, that's if, something if, that we if, are looking at. If we at. have a student, if we yeah. have a student that has graduated from the program, and the only thing mm -hmm. that is keeping them from from moving on to the next step, we will seriously consider a scholarship. Uh, for them to get their driver's license. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So Thank question, you. I'm sorry. So you, you say a lot of kids don't have their driver's license? That's correct. But it's okay. something that we struggle with. Um, if you're in a city school, mm -hmm. I, I believe, you know, they've got buses and that kind of thing, and it makes it a little bit easier. I, I know in the past for like just our WBL, in the past they've provided tokens for kids in that manner. But in Northeast Connecticut, there is not public transportation. And the cost to get a license, to do driver's training to make it less money, to pay for insurance, to get a vehicle that works. Um, and believe me, all my kids are backyard mechanics, so they usually figure out a way to get something together, but just the cost alone is very expensive. Um, insurance, I know if, if you have kids, you know how much insurance costs. Mm -hmm. It's really mm -hmm. hard for the kids to pay for all that. Their parents do not have the means to help them. Okay, so if we, if we could help with the driver's license, that would help them. Correct. Yep. Okay. We'll an obstacle out of the way, you know. So <laughs> thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Angela. Paul? Paul Costello from The Electricians. Thanks, Jeff. You able to hear me? Yes. Hi, Sherry. Thank you for putting this Hi, together Paul. as well. Sure. Uh, good morning. I'm Paul Kessel. I'm the uh, training director for IBW Local 90 Electrical Workers. Uh, 
Erin, I had a presentation. I don't know if the email went through or. Uh, was that this morning? It was this morning. I could also share my screen. I, sure. Oh, yeah, you can share your screen. Let me. Um, let me see. Uh, let me. Yeah, I got three screens going. Perfect. Okay, which one is it? Not sure if that's sharing or not. You are sharing. Um, but you need to hit slideshow from beginning, I think. Yeah, let me see. Got the wrong one going here. I think I will be moving out to period. I'm just waiting to figure out where my kids end up. Okay. Is that one sharing? Yep. Okay. Problem is when I got too many screens running over here. I hope you don't have a short circuit there, Paul. Mm -hmm. Got a ground floor yeah, protector. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I'm with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and our partnership is with our contractor association, NECA, National Electrical Contractors. So uh, combined, we've been around for a little over 120 years or so. Uh, training the electrical industry. We're one of approximately 300 programs across the US and Canada. So one of the advantages being with a, a national program is the opportunity to travel throughout the country. So when someone's recognized as a journey person wireman, um, say in Connecticut, they might be busy in um, New Jersey, they have the opportunity to travel back and forth. Also, as an apprentice, uh, I just got a request from a young lady in Long Island that's going to be moving with her family to Connecticut, looking to relocate. She's currently a third year apprentice uh, out on Long Island. She'll be starting with us probably sometime either December or January, right where she left off picking up in Connecticut. So we have three JTCs for inside wiremen, and I'll explain the difference between them, but we're based Hartford, Bridgeport, and New Haven local. So this is a list of each of the contacts for our three JTCs. Unlike some of the other programs that are gonna speak where they're statewide, we have three separate locals in Connecticut for the inside wiremen. Uh, Chris Brown is our training director in the Hartford JTC. Um, Tom Sportini takes care of our Bridgeport based in Monroe JTC and myself based out of Wallingford, but we are the New Haven local in Connecticut. Uh, and then working with the VT schools, most of us do sit on TTAC committees throughout the state. So if there's someone that's looking for a TTAC member, this would be one of the contacts depending which part of the state they're with. So within the IBW, we actually have different branches. Uh, we have an outside division. So they basically take care of the utility work, the, the line workers. There's separate programs for voice data video. Uh, Connecticut with licensing, our license as far as an inside wireman covers all the different categories. But we also do have a low voltage program. I also represent ADT, uh, Tyco Industries. So we do have some low voltage work with them. Residential really would come under the inside program. And then when we have for outside workers, if anyone is interested, um, again, this is more the utility work. On the private side, we have IBW Local 42, which is a statewide local. They're part of a program called NEAT, the Northeast um, Area Wide JATC. So their training is actually encompasses most of New England and uh, throughout New York and Pennsylvania. So they're actually based in Pennsylvania for the training side of it. So the outside, again, they do most of the distribution work, the line work, um, real good program. As I said, the program itself is based in um, Pennsylvania for that. So with the outside industry, a little different than the inside workers, they're more regional, uh, especially with the storm work that's been happening uh, also often now. 
it's not uncommon to have the outside apprentices working remotely and doing their training remotely as they follow the storms throughout the uh, Northeast and actually all through uh, the United States. Voice data video, again, uh, we do some of this with ADT and Tyco, but primarily it's our inside wiremen. So we not only install the power distribution, but we do all the fire alarm systems, telecommunications, fiber optics, security access, and so on. Residential, uh, Connecticut doesn't have a residential license. The journey person's license covers that type of work. So we do commercial, industrial, and residential wiring. Again, some of the projects that we've completed uh, in Connecticut, Smilo Cancer Center, uh, chemical plants, Pfizer Pharmaceutical is one of our big customers. Yale University is a major customer in the New Haven area. Ultimately, uh, throughout the apprenticeship, what the apprentice is working towards is their state license. So we do work with uh, all the VT schools. Uh, I saw Heidi was on earlier. I'm not sure if she's back. Um, also, Pat Carliglio with the adult ed side of it. So we try to um, get out to the schools as often as possible. Uh, just like all the trades, typical job site, seven o'clock start. Um, reliable transportation. I know uh, Angelo spoke about it, Jeff spoke about it. Really can't stress the importance of having reliable transportation and to be able to get from job site to job site. Unfortunately, we had an apprentice last year, um, an Eli Whitney graduate that I tried putting him out to work for over a year and he had to take time off because he doesn't have transportation. Job sites typically aren't on bus routes. Um, you know, again, depending where they live, they, they really need to be able to get to that job site. Job sites typically start at seven. We're seeing a lot of job sites now working for 10 hour days starting at six o'clock, especially throughout the summer to uh, try to get a, an earlier start on the day, get more time in. As far as wages, uh, just to give you a rough idea uh, what an apprentice upon completion potentially could earn. Currently in the New Haven area, our wage is $39 an hour everything below that are contributions that the employer puts into different funds. When we retire, there's three separate pensions. We have a local pension, international, and a contractor pension. In addition to that, there's an annuity similar to a 401k that they're uh, earning. So approximate wages for a journey person, uh, around $77,000, $80,000 a year, again, based on 2,000 hours a year. Total package puts them over 125, 130,000 when you start adding all the benefits in. And especially when we're talking to high school students in general, uh, you gotta break it down per minute and just show the importance. We gotta be productive on that job site. You know, every minute that we're working, it's realistically when you add all the other costs for a contractor's insurance, um, unemployment compensation, taxes, you're probably well over a dollar and a quarter a minute. When we look at the apprentices, uh, so this is the starting wages for an apprentice. Our first year apprentice, again, just coming in, no prior training, uh, first thousand hours for six months is 1560. Uh, they start receiving contributions towards their health coverage in addition to the different pensions. They get an increase after their first thousand hours. Uh, we start getting some grades and attendance in the classroom, job site reports, then they bump up 5% of the journeyman's wage. So that puts them at 17.55. Uh, now they complete full year of uh, related instructions. They bump up to 50% of what the journey person's wages at that point, 19.50. Uh, wages and benefits uh, included after that in addition. And then each year upon completion of a full school year and now 1500 hours out in the field for OJT training, it's 10% increments of the journey person's wage. So right now our starting wage, as I said, is 1560 for first year, 31 
20 for our fifth year apprentices before they get their license. You know, just to break it out as far as, you know, wages compared to maybe that apprentice or that high school graduate considering difference between apprenticeship and maybe looking at going to college. Uh, just roughly broke it out, again, based on 2,000 hours a year. They have the potential of earning about 225000 or more as an apprentice. Uh, it's not uncommon. I actually I had to uh, sign a letter for one of our apprentices stating their wages and their next uh, expected raise when it was due to sign off for their mortgage. Um, we got a lot of apprentices in their second and third year buying homes, which is great. Minimum requirements, high school grad, uh, GED, one year of algebra to passing grade. Uh, really can stress the importance of having the, the strong math background for all the construction trades. They do have to uh, pass an aptitude test that's validated, uh, has math and reading comprehension on that. And very last step in the process is to be drug free as well. So there is a drug test. As far as our class is a little different than um, the Carpenters program. So our program, we do evening classes. Uh, all three of our JTCs in Connecticut pretty much follow school calendar. So the classes start in September and we finish up in June. Uh, our case, two nights a week, Monday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday rotation, 5.30 to 8.30. And I believe all three of our, well, actually uh, Bridgeport right now is in full in-class, but we as well have gone to a hybrid. So we're in class one evening online for the second evening. Again, no cost for the program other than the cost of textbooks, uh, which does include a laptop in their first year. So our first, for ourselves, as far as when we had to make the transition to go online back in March with the remainder of the school year due to COVID, it really wasn't a big transition for us. The homework itself is online, so they go into a secure website. That's where they do all their homework. Um, they've already had their textbooks. It was just a matter of getting our instructors familiar using Zoom and some of the other technology. Uh, so it really wasn't that big of a transition for us. Uh, definitely, as you know, everyone online, I'm sure, knows it's not a substitute for in-person training, but it, it's getting us through it. Um, any Great, Paul. That I can answer, maybe? I had a question, Paul. So sure. um, you said there's no cost for the program, but do they have to buy their own books? They do buy their own textbooks. Okay. First and how year, much are they due generally, would you say? Yeah, so on an average, uh, first year is the most expensive. This year it was eleven fifty, but that did include the laptop. Okay. Um, a lot of those textbooks will carry over throughout the five years. On an average, they could figure about $700 per year, I would say. Thank you. That's including the textbook and the online curriculum. Great. Thanks. Great. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take uh, going to take a few minute break and come back at. If you can come back at ten fifteen, we normally would have refreshments for you, <laughs> and so this is the best that we can do under the <laughs> under the circumstances. So we'll see you. We'll see you back at ten fifteen. And uh, Joe, you'll be up when we come back. All right, see you after coffee break. Right, don't mess with the coffee break.
Okay, so let's get back on track if we can. And I'm going to go over here to my inbox and Stacy gets the prize for being the first to send a message through this portal wanting to sign up her school. So uh, looks like Stacy went to the website, went to request a program, put in the information and I now have it. Thank you very much and we'll, we'll follow up. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Joe McGloin serves uh, at least a dual role, if not more, in this program. He, he represents the, the iron workers out of, uh, out of Hartford, out of the Hartford area. He was an absolute blessing this summer when we needed space to hold some of our programs. And he let us come into his training center on multiple days. Uh, and he also did the CPR first aid certification for us. So we're going to turn the floor over to Joe McGloin from the Iron Workers. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm going to share a screen. So hopefully this will go through. Uh, can everybody see that? Good. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Joe McGloin. Um, as Jeff said, um, I, I work with Iron Workers Local 15. I am covering. Uh, today's session for the apprenticeship coordinator, uh, Jim Denning, um, who's on vacation this week. We had a uh, change in coordinators back in March. And like Angelo, I was retired. Um, I retired back in 2017 and I was working part-time and now it just seems you can never get away. So we cover um, three quarters of the state of Connecticut with a sister uh, local in New Haven, Connecticut, who covers uh, the greater New Haven area up through Waterbury, where they have that nice mix master project going on right now, um, down to the uh, uh, New York border and the Gold Coast. And, you know, we pretty much cover the other area. We have a couple of nice uh, DOT projects going right now. Uh, anybody that's been in the greater Hartford area. Uh, can see the uh, Charter Oak um, work that's being done um, as they add the new lanes. So, you know, we're, we're doing quite well. Our program is a uh, four-year apprenticeship program that we like to call the other four-year degree. Um, it's a learn as you, uh, you're paid as you, as you learn. Um, our apprentices work during the day. We do uh, nighttime training like a lot of the different trades. Uh, two nights a week, they come to school. Uh, there are some Saturdays involved, but um, the rest of the time they're out in the field uh, learning the trade. We do structural steel uh, besides the highways. Um, we do uh, reinforcing rod, uh, precast, siding, grading, uh, pretty much anything that deals with steel we're gonna do. As you can see, our working conditions, high rises, um, sometimes bridges, sometimes uh, commercial industrial plants. And again, it is very strenuous. It is very hard work. You have to be in good physical shape. And a fear of heights is not something that um, would, would be very good for, for our type of work because um, at some point, you are going to be working up in the air. All right. So it's very important to keep that in mind that, you know, if you're a little nervous about heights, um, our job uh, has quite a few uh, aspects that deal with working up in the air. So our Pacific requirements or our program Pacifics is, you know, we're, we're an 8,000 hour program, a four year program. Again, we do two or three nights a week with some Saturdays. And in the classroom, um, right now we are doing, um, like a lot of the trades, we are doing computer-based uh, learning due to COVID. Um, our hands-on training, um, the classes have been downsized um, to adhere to the uh, governor's guidelines for COVID. 
Um, so it was usually uh, welding class that would have 16 students in it now is uh, split in half and um, two groups of eight, um, two different nights. So like a lot of uh, the trades, we've had to adapt. Um, and now with the uh, new breakdown, uh, I guess it's going to affect, we're looking at uh, changing our uh, hands-on trading some more. The uh, cost of the books, uh, the apprentices are uh, given the books for free uh, over the course of the four years. So there's no uh, cost for them. And we teach all aspects of our trade, everything from structural to uh, reinforcing rods, to post tensioning, um, layout instruments, uh, blueprint reading, uh, cranes and rigging, uh, welding. Uh, we do certify our um, apprentice, apprentices in the Connecticut DOT uh, state welding test, as well as the um, iron worker uh, welding um, certificates as well. For us, um, we take applications uh, the first Monday of every month uh, between the hours of 8 and 3.30. Presently, we are asking that if anybody is interested in doing applications, to call the apprenticeship office and to make an appointment for that Pacific Monday. This way, you know, we can adhere to the uh, social distancing guidelines, making sure that we don't have uh, a number of people in at the same time. And it also gives uh, the apprentice coordinator a chance to uh, talk to the individuals on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, session in regards to, you know, what's expected of an iron worker apprentice. And you know what our requirements are um, as far as schooling, on the job, and so forth. Have to be at least 18 years of age, um, have a high school diploma or the GED. Again, you have to be able to uh, be drug free. The most important part of it, um, and it's been stressed a couple of times here, is that you know transportation is very important. Um, our jobs are. Uh, all over the state of Connecticut. Um, actually, this past year, we've had uh, some of our apprentices working up in the um, Northampton, uh, Amherst area, um, helping out local uh, seven Springfield uh, with manpower. We've also uh, sent a couple of our apprentices as far east as Fall River, Massachusetts, um, this past fall, helping out Ironworkers Local 37 in Providence. Um, uh, with staffing. So there's no guarantee that you're going to be um, working in the state of Connecticut at some times. You know, uh, if the opportunity arises um, to help our other locals, you know, we will send the apprentices uh, where, they're, where they're needed. Again, we supply all the tools. Uh, we supply their books. Um, it does say that there is a uh, cost for the tools. That's in there um, in case that, in, as it happens, sometimes people misplace or uh, lose their equipment. So we just let them know that if it has to be replaced, they're going to um, have to do the cost on the uh, replacement. Everybody that comes in uh, fills out the application. Uh, when the selection process comes, uh, they're brought in, uh, they do a uh, aptitude test, then we um, notify them of a time and a date to come in to do a uh, interview process. And the interview process is with uh, three members of management and three members of the uh, union's JATC program, um, after which uh, they make their selection. Um, our class sizes run anywhere from 10 up to uh, 18 apprentices. Um, we keep the classes to a size that we know we can pretty much guarantee that we can uh, have the apprentices out working. We have a 90 day, I'm sorry, we have a nine month uh, probationary period um, for the apprentices to, um, to adhere to. At the end of the uh, four-year program, they will uh, receive their journeyman certificate. 
Uh, in the meantime, um, we let them know that, you know, they, they started 60% of what a journey makes. So they're going to start off about $21 and 60 cents an hour. Um, every six months, there's a 5% increase, but we also like to, um, reward, uh, apprentices that, um, get their welding papers, um, uh, in a timely fashion. So uh, we let everybody know that once you receive your uh, iron worker uh, welding certification and the uh, there's a 10% uh, raise. So, you know, sometimes some of our apprentices, we have one now who's uh, in the sec first half of his second year, who's um, already at 90% uh, due to the fact that he is uh, got his uh, state of Connecticut iron worker welding papers, his iron worker. Matter of fact, he's got all the welding papers that we can um, issue. So, you know, he uh, came in with prior welding experience um, and he was able to put that to use to uh, give himself the uh, extra certifications, which makes him even more employable for his contractor. Joe, so uh -huh. this is all uh, this is all great information. I have just one one question for you before we we move to our next presenter. You said you have a classes of oh ten or so. Ten, ten to eighteen. Ten to eighteen. Yeah. How yeah. many applicants are there for those ten to eighteen spots? Uh, we average uh, probably um, two to four hundred applicants a year. So, so you have two to two to four hundred applicants, and you and you're you're taking ten to twenty. Yes. So you've got to be the best of the best. Well, that's what we tell them that when they come in. It's you know uh, there's the aptitude test, but we tell them the the, the important one is, is the uh, the interview itself. Um, that's their time to uh, let us know you know why we we should be interested in them. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we stress in this pre-apprenticeship program, stress getting them ready to submit their applications and what the apprenticeship directors are looking for. Joe, thank you very much. If you could stop sharing your screen. I certainly will. All right, Aaron, you pick up the screen. We're gonna go to Ray Johnson now from the Laborers Union. Ray? Good morning, everybody. Ray Johnson, Laborers Apprenticeship Coordinator. Nice to meet everybody. Um, I wanna start off by talking about what the laborers actually do for work. I know a lot of um, people really don't understand what type of work that the laborers do. So the laborers are involved in all of your heavy highway and bridge construction, along with building construction. All of your water pipe, all your sewer pipe, all your gas pipe, all your curbing that's placed on both sides of the road, any placing of asphalt, any placing of concrete, we do. We put all that water pipe in the ground, sewer pipe, concrete, um, demolition of bridges, demolition of roadways. That's all our work. Um, on the building side, all of your land clearing, all of your site work, all of your scaffold erection all of your you could be a mason tender on a job so a mason tender the mason is obviously the guy that's putting all the brick and block up mason tender is the laborer that's erecting all the scaffold and bringing him all the uh brick or block that they're placing mixing all the mortar for them so they're going to have to have very good math skills in order to count quantities and get the right quantities out to them how long is the laborer's apprenticeship program Labor's Apprenticeship Program is a three-year program consisting of two parts, 320 classroom training hours and 4,000 work hours. Usually takes you about anywhere between two and a half years to three years to graduate the apprenticeship program. What are your requirements to enter the Labor's Apprenticeship Program? 18 years old, driver's license, high school diploma, and willing to submit to a drug test. Again, that driver's license that all of the other trades talked upon is very important because our jobs are all over the state and there are no bus lines. 
prior to stepping foot on a job site, we send you to one of our state-of-the-art facilities, either in Pomfret, Connecticut, or Hopkinton, Mass, for four weeks of training, Monday through Friday, 40 hours per week. Once you complete the first four weeks of training, that gives you 160 towards the 320 hours that you need to graduate our program. Then you get placed out on a job site, and that's how we start accruing our 4,000 work hours. Rate of pay, where do we start? As a, as a laborer, a journey person laborer is at $31 an hour in the state of Connecticut right now. Our first year apprentices start out at $18.60, which is 60% of the rate. Every thousand hours they work, they get a 10% increase in pay until they become a journey person. 10% is about $3 per hour. Also, what makes this a career and not a job is the benefit package of it. The benefit package is an additional $21 an hour. In that $21 an hour in the state of Connecticut, they have to work 1,000 hours per year to get their health coverage. If they work 1,000 hours, they maintain their health coverage every year. In that benefit package, there's also a $4.10 annuity. Every hour they work, $4.10 gets placed into their annuity. So you basically have a high school kid starting out at $18.60 Plus, if we look at that annuity end of it, every hour they work, they work 40 hours this week, $160 gets put into their annuity. That's a glorified savings account, 401k for them. Um, when do we accept applications? We accept applications the first Thursday of every month at all of our different locals throughout the state of Connecticut. So we have six locals throughout the state of Connecticut, all the way from Norwalk, to Groton. So you have uh, Bridge, you got Norwalk, you got Bridgeport, you got Hartford, you have Waterbury, New Haven, and Groton. So we always suggest that the apprentice applies to the local that's closest to their home, because that's the area that they could possibly be working in. That's basically where they would stay in that general, general vicinity for work. Um, Jeff spoke earlier about three individuals that graduated out of Putnam Tech out in Massachusetts, and they did go through one of our construction craft laborers program, and they also did take the Massachusetts DOT program. These three individuals graduated as high school students, graduated, came into the apprenticeship program, went through four weeks of training out in Pomfret, Connecticut. Jeff had made a connection with a woman, a the president of Palmer Paving, and she expressed interest in these three individuals because they did possess CDL licenses. She realizes she has an aging workforce and she's looking to replenish her aging workforce with young high school students that are eager to learn and want to work. Both of those individuals today are still working for Palmer Paving. I went out a couple of weeks ago, spoke with um, the apprentices in the owner of Palmer Paven. She was so happy with the way that these guys are working on the job site and what they're producing and what they have to offer her company that she's looking forward to continue on moving and being able to replace her aging workforce with high school students. So this is a great opportunity to introduce your students to the building trades and what the building trades actually have to offer your students. Um, I'll stop there. Erin's gonna show a video of our two different training sites that we have, one in Hopkinton, one out in Pomfret, Connecticut. And they really truly are state-of-the-art facilities that uh, it's, your, it's a college, it's your college campus, it's your college campus. In 1969, before there were state-of-the-art training campuses in New England, there was a vision, a call to become something greater, a call to prepare the Laborers International Union of North America for the future that lay ahead. Well, the future is now.
today, we continue to advance the vision that started it all. Training the highly skilled labor force that is building our today while preparing for tomorrow. From expansions to both campuses and a labor force taught and led by our nationally recognized training staff that continues to stay ahead of the curve, we are excited for a future in which the best is yet to come. The future is now. You train, you do. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Thanks, Ray. You're welcome, Jeff. It, one of the things that when I first saw this video, I had some of those students in my classes. I said, oh, it's Isaiah. I knew that kid was going to go far. He was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, and, and one of the things I think we failed to mention is people like our presenters, you know, they all started out as first year apprentices. They're now training directors. They're now instructors. You know, that's the first step of the ladder. You can go as far as you want to go. As far as you want to go. So, Jeff, if I could just say one thing. We do have an agreement with colleges online that as apprentices graduate our program, they can apply for labor management classes and get, I want to, don't get hold me to this, but I want to say it's like 20 credits towards a labor management degree in college. We have memorandums of, of agreement with colleges. So the, they, can, they can bring this to wherever they want to bring it. Absolutely, absolutely. And now you may wonder how we decided what what format to go in, who to go first, who to go next. And in order to be fair to everybody, I did it alphabetical. So we started with the carpenters, we end up with the operators, but also everybody wants to be an operator. Yeah. <laughs> everybody wants to be an operator. Go ahead, John. Okay, well, well thank you, uh, Jeff. Uh, I do quite a bit of these, uh, there are quite a few here with, with Jeff's group, with some other uh, community outreach. Uh, a couple of uh, things I just want to stress before I get going is, uh, number one, it's a common misconception that the construction trades are all under one union. It's obvious now that uh, there's many, uh, many different unions here that make up the construction trades. Uh, we all work together on all these projects uh, and any choice that any, any, any young person heads into the trades, no matter which choice it is, it's a very good choice. Um, I stress that. And naturally, we tease each other a little bit about, you know, who should go which direction, but obviously they're all very good choices. Um, as a father of three, uh, paying on, on colleges and, and seeing where your children end up and, and looking at uh, Paul Costello's presentation with the, uh, the cost of, or the, the, the amount of money you could make while you're in college uh, and, and you're taken out of those working years, add that to the cost of college, you really have to look at the value of college and say, is this the direction that we're going to that we want our young people to head. Uh, it has to be considered uh, the value. So onto the operating engineers. We are the men and women that run the heavy equipment to, to help build these roads, highways, bridges, hospitals, and schools. Um, we have two programs. We have uh, an operator apprenticeship program, which is a four year, 6,000 hour program. And we also represent the men and women that fix the mechanics that fit fix these machines and, uh, and trucks. And that's a mechanic apprenticeship and that's a four year 8,000 hour uh, program. Uh, we do have some criteria. Uh, you have to be 18 years old before the program uh, starts. You need a high school diploma or GED. You have to be able to pass a drug screen. You need a Connecticut driver's license because you will be tested with a CDL uh, B during your uh, apprenticeship. So you have to have a Connecticut driver's license or you can have, uh, if you have an out-of-state one, it has to be converted over. And you have to be able to pass the CDL physical. Um, we anticipate three to 400 people a year apply for our program. So it's very competitive to, to get in. Uh, we usually take anywhere between 15 to 20 people per class. Very uh, competitive. Our, uh, our local, local 478, encompasses all, this, all of the state of Connecticut. 
Uh, we look on a map, Connecticut looks small when you have to drive from one corner to the other corner, you'd be surprised how big the state is. We, we try to enforce that. Uh, our community outreach, not only here, but the other uh, places that we reach out to has enabled us to have, uh, right now we have 14 and a half percent females in our apprenticeship program. Uh, we were high at one time as uh, 16 and a half. Uh, we've had very uh, much success with females. Uh, like anything else, they come with their own unique challenges too. Um, and right now uh, in our operator program, we have 24.5% uh, uh, minorities in our program. So we have quite a diverse uh, situation. Um, our apprenticeship program is uh, very similar to the other trades. Uh, our starting rate is 23, 23 an hour for a first year apprentice. And how it works for us, if you, if you come and apply, uh, you have to apply in person. We're working on something for online with this COVID. Um, you come and apply in person, you have to be prepared to take a mechanical aptitude assessment test. You have to be able to reach a, a satisfactory grade in order to pass that. Uh, if you pass that test, you call in for an interview. Um, if you cannot pass the mechanical aptitude assessment, your trip stops right there. Uh, once you pass one interview, we narrow the field down. You have to pass another interview and then you get invited into a program uh, that's going to start off with six weeks of what we call boot camp, Monday through Friday, seven to three thirty, for six weeks, five days a week, and you're not paid for that training. I get a lot of questions. Well, gee, how come I'm not paid for that six weeks? And my answer is, how much does college pay you when you go to college? The cost for each one of our apprentices cost us internally almost sixty thousand dollars by the time by the time we were done with four years of training. Um, which is zero cost to the student. The only cost the student has is any licenses fees that are state of Connecticut. Example would be CDLB license. We show them how to drive the trucks. We do all we can with them. They actually have to pay for the license, what I believe is 71 or $79. Same through a hoisted license or a crane license upon your, upon your fourth year. During your six weeks of that boot camp you're gonna get the basic necessities you need to have success as a first year apprentice. That's when you're gonna acquire your CDLB license. You get about three weeks of training on the bulldozers, backhoes, skid steers and excavators down in our sand pit. You acquire a uh, OSHA 10 that is flavored toward what, towards what an operating engineer would really need. Uh, you're gonna get uh, what's called an MSHA cert, which allows you to work in mines and quarries. Um, and uh, you get a forklift certificate. On the operator side, it's an 8,000 hour program that covers four years. I'm not gonna get much into the nuts and bolts of that because I'm the operator apprentice coordinator and mechanic uh, coordinator, that's his specialty. Um, but the, the classroom ends of it there is uh, very substantial. That's an 8,000 hour program because as a rule, there's no anticipated layoff like there might be during a winter season uh, in the construction site. Um, how we progress over a four year period. Uh, once a first year, uh, once you finish your boot camp and you go on to your first year of apprenticeship and you, you start to make your 23, 23 an hour, you're required to come back a couple of Saturdays a month and a couple of evens a month for additional training. Once you have completed 1500 hours of both training and on the job added together, you have to take a, uh, a, a test of, of qualification on a certain machine. If you pass that, you get bumped up to a second year apprentice. Second year apprentice rate bumps you up to 27, 10 an hour. And then your requirements start all over again. You have to satisfy so many hours of on the job and so many hours of uh, school related training. Uh, when that hits the magic number of 1500, you take a, a test again for, for real quality and then you're promoted to a third year apprentice. Third year apprentice rate is 3097. Fourth year apprentice rate is 34, 84 an hour. And as a journey person, uh, we our rates are all different per machine that you run. Usually the more difficult the machine is, the more that it pays. But it usually ranges from anywhere from 32, $33 an hour, right up to, if you get in some of these biggest cranes, you could be up, up over $50 an hour. Any questions on that? I did have a YouTube- Where do I um, sign up? What's that? Where do I sign up? <laughs> yeah, I did have a YouTube uh, presentation I was going to show, and, and, and just time is moving on here. 
and it's, it's kind of lengthy. Um, I just want to show you there again, I'm working from home because I'm quarantined. Uh, my wife actually, her office, there was COVID in uh, one person in her office. Everybody got tested. Everybody's negative. I got quarantined, so even though I don't work there. So I'm home. Uh, I had some, Jeff wanted some toys. I don't have my box of toys that I usually present with. I'm not going to show that video because it's too long, but I did rob my, my grandson's toy box downstairs and I got a bucket loader. So I just want to show you, <laughs> this is what we do right here. Here's a bucket loader. And Jeff, I had to keep you happy because now you're going to big excavator. <laughs> Jeff, and here's the Oh, escalator. there we okay. go. All right. <laughs> Ray, uh, John always lets me run the machine when we go there. That, so that's I, right. And, and you always do a great job. So, <laughs> but and the other toy I want to show is behind behind uh, Jeff to his right. There's one, there's a tower crane. So yeah, they have that, a that's all I have for you guys today. I'm not right. going to. And uh, John and the other presenters, if you have any more videos that you'd like to have on the website, we will put them on the website under the link for your trade. So uh, John, make sure you send Aaron that, that video. Okay. Uh, Sh Sherry, you had a couple of comments in between. Did you want to? Uh, oh, yeah. I um, didn't remember that we did um, give out a um, driver's license scholarship in the past. So I wanted to mention that. Yeah, we have so I young, know somebody, somebody had have, asked about that. Yeah, we had a young man that that was the only thing that mm -hmm. was holding him up from applying. He had passed all his other credentials and certifications and that was it. And so, you know what? We've invested so much in him already. A little bit more to get him over the line just isn't going to make a difference. Right. Now we got hit with COVID, but uh, I think he's he's very close to testing. Or uh, you know, if that's all it's going to take to get him over the line, we're for it. And I have to say, I can the the, the support that the that the Connecticut Department of Transportation and our program partners have is just unbelievable. And I urge you please take advantage of these mm -hmm. programs. All they want to do is help your student. That's all they want to do. <laughs> questions for me or for any of the presenters? Anyone have any questions for me? Uh, Heidi, are you still on? I see she was on, off, on, off. I wanted to thank her. Thank her for setting up this meeting. Uh, without her, it would not have been possible. And I want to thank you all that. Oh, I see a hand. Yes. Hi, uh, Jeff. Quick question. I was on your website and tried to uh, request a program. And I did my credentials in there, but the date somehow could not go through. So I just oh. left okay, it blank so and took it. Let's see. Well, well, at this point, I, I do... I do have your contact information. And so uh, I see, uh, Aaron, so all it's, all that they're getting for dates interested equals dates interested. Okay. So, so we're I'll gonna, that. thank you for that. We're gonna, we're gonna work on that. Okay. Yeah, can I just remark, um, thank you very much for putting together such a great uh, presentation. You gave us a lot of information. It was easy, easy to digest. Um, your presenters were very uh, fun to listen to, and I really appreciate, and as I'm sure the deans uh, also appreciate, the time and effort you put into the presentation. It was time well spent. Um, that isn't ordinarily the case for professional development for us all the time. So thank you very, very much to your team for putting this all together for us. Well, thank you, and thank, thank you, you for the kind words. And yeah. this all, every, this recording will be on the website. Erin's gonna try to put that on the website. My presentation for the guidance counselors program, uh, for the school-based coordinators program is on the website. Uh, we certainly appreciate your concerns and your ideas, and your ideas. And if we need to tweak something, change something, add something, uh, I, I think that, that we can make those things happen. Uh, if we, we can customize the programs. We can do whatever we need to do to move this, move your students forward. Uh, honestly, uh, this is a great opportunity for our students here in the Bridgeport. And somehow we can tweak, as you're saying, like and make it conducive for our work-based learning program to be aligned with your program. It will be like amazing. 
Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I do know that uh, historically, if we can take the students through a program and then take the best of the best and put them in the work-based learning or the co-op situation where the employer gets a good look at them and they get a good look at the employer, then usually things happen. Yes. And they can say, yes, I, I can see myself going here. Or you know what? Not that's for not me. for me. Yeah. That's not for me. And in both cases, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. That's, that's time well spent in both cases. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Sherry, Deborah, do you have any final words, comments? No, Jeff, I just wanted to thank you guys. You did a fabulous job as usual. Yeah. Um, the unions, you guys are great to work with. Sherry and I were just talking about that last week, how you guys really just take the, you guys really take the bull by the horn in terms of making things happen. So we can't think of a better partnership than to partner with you guys. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Program partners, thank you once again. I'll be reaching out to you. And for those of you that have signed up through the website, I'll be reaching out to you. Heidi, I see you back on. Heidi, would you like to say, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that, I was on mute. Um, I really wanna thank you guys for um, putting this together and I can share with you, my deans of students um, will be having a fall activity where we'll be doing a field trip. Um, and I think you'll get an opportunity to really see some of what is going on um, at some of the training centers and all of that kind of information. So, um, but I think many of our work-based learning coordinators may have been aware of a lot of the apprenticeship opportunities, but really getting to delve in and see some of this and have an opportunity to maybe share some of the information with their students is always a bonus. Thank you, and I, I'm not sure if you're on when I thank you for, for allowing us to present to your group today. So with, with that, I'm, I'm done. We if, appreciate that, thank you. And our deans, just remember, we're going into our Google Meet code, um, deans, and um, we'll be meeting with the apprenticeship coordinator, Tad Birch, um, and you can ask some apprenticeship questions if you have any, um, maybe even from information you learned here today. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Great Thank you. Your time. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Jeff, great job. Thank great you, job. Ray. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care.